Welcome to the High Existence Podcast. I am your host, John Brooks, and today I'm going to be speaking to epigenetic coach David Krantz alongside my co-interviewer, Eric Brown. You can find out more about Eric Brown on Podcast 28, where I go deep. It's a three-hour conversation I have with Eric about spirituality and productivity. I'll give you a quick overview of David and what's involved in this mind-boggling episode. So David originally started out as an electronic musician. He performed a lot and eventually burned himself out and had fatigue, would pass out randomly, nervous system dysregulation, stomach problems, depression, overall lack of motivation. He was just in a physically bad state, so much so that he wasn't able to pursue his passion as he wanted his passion sort of killed him. To solve this issue, he started studying health, nutrition, and soon started devouring biohacking books and podcasts, anything that he could get his hands on. He studied and started experimenting so he could figure out how to solve this problem. You'll often see that the people worth listening to about a particular subject are the ones that struggled with it the most. That's a theme that I've observed many times during these interviews. In a beautiful synchronicity, which we'll get into more in the podcast, David ended up becoming a student of his favorite podcast host, Dr. Daniel Stickler, who was a world-renowned expert on nutritional genetics and epigenetics. Dr. Stickler saw great potential in David, and David lived up to that potential, becoming a very promising epigenetic coach. Since going through this training, this apprenticeship, David has gone on to work with Google product designers, cancer researchers, Broadway actors, writers, creative entrepreneurs, and other kinds of artists to help them rewire their brains and give them that boost in brain function, productivity, and overall wellness. But really, we are scratching the tip of the iceberg for what David does in his daily coaching practice. He has so much to share with you in this episode. It's it's very dense, very packed, full of practical tips. Some of the things that Eric and I discuss with David are, what does an epigenetic health coach do? What sort of biomarkers should we focus on if we want to improve our performance or longevity or mood. We go into David's revealing experience, testing his own genome, what David thinks about sleep and health tracking tools, what apps he recommends. We, we go into how we can combine the minutiae of the scientific method of epigenetic testing with a more holistic spiritual way of life. We look at the difference between being healthy and having optimal health. There's a significant difference here. We also get a bit nerdy and discuss what DNA actually is and what it does in our body. We talk about the impact of epigenetics on our genomic expression. We look into the psychology of past trauma, past lives, how our physiology might be shaped in the womb as well as just an abundance of tips that you can start practicing today to improve your sleep and start feeling much sharper, healthier, and higher functioning. And one last thing before you dive into this episode, if you do enjoy this interview, it does really help us if you leave a review and a rating on the, on the podcast episode. Thank you very much for your support. This is David Krantz. Uh, Okay, so I want to just start broadly, David. On your website, you say that you are an epigenetic health coach. So for our listeners, what does that mean? Uh, What is an epigenetic health coach? Yeah, absolutely. So epigenetics is the study of how genes change expression in response to different stimuluses, stimuli in the environment. So anything from food to the air you're breathing to the light your body is exposed to, uh, to stress that you're under, um, kind of all the different things that you encounter in your life, our genes are actually very dynamic and able to respond to 
uh, these different situations. And so what I specialize in is looking at the body and health from that perspective of how do we create optimal genetic expression um, through what we know through studies and um, you know, experience working with people from uh, this angle. And what I'd like you—you you mentioned a few of them, but could you give us like an uh, like a slightly more elaborate list of the different factors that you look for? Yeah, absolutely. So um, nutrition is one. Nutrition is huge. Um, you know, I mean, we're, when I think about the body, you know, I really kind of level it out in terms of what information is the body receiving. Uh, we're we're really. You know, there, there's a lot of interesting kind of larger theories looking at information as this sort of substructure of the universe, but our bodies are designed as these really complex information processing machines. So, um, you know, nutrition, sleep, um, toxins, uh, exercise and movement, um, you know, drugs, whether those are pharmaceutical or uh, entheogens or anything like that. Um, like I mentioned before, the light that you're exposed to, which is actually huge and I think uh, a pretty underappreciated component of the way that the body uh, adapts and, and changes over time, uh, as well as emotional things, um, you know, trauma, relationships, um, living your purpose and actually getting in touch with really what, what drives you and, and creates positive emotional states has also been shown to have impact epigenetically. Um, so really looking at, you know, kind of a holistic picture of, you know, what you're putting in your body, what you're doing with your time and seeing how that can go into really fueling your body and, um, you know, mitigating potential risks and really leading you into the the healthiest uh, most energetic place you can be when people come to you to to work with you what's like the the starting point for the, for most people is it something like they're tired they're groggy they're, they're lacking energy or is there like not one particular starting point but people come to you for many many different reasons yeah people come for me to me for different reasons but a lot of it is just what you said you know um people that are Oh, feeling okay, but kind of know that they could be feeling better. They could have more energy when they wake up. Uh, they could have more focus throughout the day. They, you know, know that they could have a little more physical uh, vibrancy in their life. Mm. And you know, in terms of kind of where I start with people, I, I use genetic testing to really get an understanding of how people are wired, and then kind of match up uh, those different lifestyle factors with their genes. And you know, I kind of look at it. Um, a little bit like if you were going to load software onto a computer, you would want to know whether that computer was a Mac machine or a Windows machine or a Linux machine. And mm. you would load slightly different software on. You'd give those things different information to run on. Uh, and, and, and it's kind of similar where by understanding how someone's wired at the genetic level, you get a feel for like what their deep hardware is like. And then we might choose different nutrition strategies or different supplements or uh, different sleep protocols, all that kind of stuff I mentioned before um, to really match up with that. And it's really about matching your genes with the right environmental inputs and the right information, uh, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, totally. When I think of like the kind of generic healthy lifestyle, you know, it's like eight hours of sleep, um, like a certain um, a certain amount of calories and macronutrients, and getting all of your micronutrients in as well, different vitamins, having those taken care of, uh, a bit of exercise, you know, like the the general healthy lifestyle um, that seems to be the protocol that's given to everyone because it's like it's for an average when you analyze someone's genetics how much variance is there from person to person in how much you would adapt that basic protocol for them oh that's a really good question i mean like no doubt there's certain things that are going to be really foundational for almost everyone and you know sleep is going to be one of those things but when you start looking at pathways in in the brain and you know say that synthesize melatonin, you might find someone has um, you know, a different set of enzyme uh, production, uh, you know, different amounts of enzymes that synthesize melatonin. So you, you might 
uh, I might kind of recommend a different way to improve sleep from one person to another. So a lot of this is kind of, um, you know, looking at commonalities, but then looking at the individual differences of actually how you get there. And in terms of diet, there's pretty a pretty wide range. Um, you know, you see people that are really into the keto approach or the paleo approach or vegan approach um, and kind of the, the whole range of diets. And those things all work for people. And I think we're really entering a place now uh, where it's not about trying to find one approach that works for everyone. Like the food pyramid experiment has failed. Um, you know, it's really about understanding uh, that there's not a perfect diet for everyone, but there's a perfect uh, diet for each person. And mm -hmm. so, you know, the range of macronutrients can, can vary pretty widely. Um, you know, I work with some people that are vegan. I work with some people that do keto. Um, and for me, it's about kind of uh, eliminating the dogma of, hey, this there, there's a right diet, period. It's more about, you know, these are different tools. Uh, these are different strategies that can be used. And it's just kind of about figuring out which one is going to work best for, for each person. Um, and, you know, across the board, you know, in terms of looking at different herbs and supplements, uh, that can get very specific and very different for, for, you know, different people, depending on what they're experiencing and uh, what parts of the human system we want to uh, either, you know, boost or suppress in some cases. Um, so, you know, it, it ranges pretty significantly from person to person. That's really fascinating. I would imagine that all sorts of like hidden nutritional gems would show up after the testing for someone. I remember reading The 4-Hour Body quite a while ago and Tim mm -hmm. Ferriss was saying that he, after he started testing himself, he realized he had a selenium deficiency and then he set out to correct that and he had that for years and didn't know. Um, is that, do you find things like that out when you do the, this, these tests? Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's interesting to see certain patterns emerge over time um, in terms of, you know, just seeing certain correlations with certain genes and i'll give you an experience or an experience of mine personally that i think is pretty telling um, are, are you familiar with chaga mushroom you heard of it yeah a little yeah so it, you know it's a medicinal mushroom um the chinese refer to it as one as like the um i believe it's like the immortal mushroom or king of the mushroom something you know they put mm. it very high in their pharmacopoeia um and it's very high in this enzyme called sod or superoxide dismutase which is a really important mitochondrial enzyme that um you know really helps with energy production and reduces oxidants or things that cause cellular damage um and there's a really strong variant uh genetic variant that some people um, create less of that enzyme naturally um, and I actually, I have that variant. Um, it's associated with a whole range of, you know, potential issues down the road. And the first time I ever did chaga, and this was before I, uh, I looked at my genes, I, I felt like I was high. Like I felt like I just got the super energy boost and my partner at the time didn't get that at all. Um, you know, she was like, mm. yeah, this tastes good, but whatever. And I was like, are you kidding me? This feels amazing. And uh, <laughs> when I looked at both of our genes later on, what I, I realized is that she has the version that where she makes sufficient SOD naturally, and I have the version where I make less of it. And so, you know, that uh, what I was experiencing was like just getting enough of that enzyme for the first time in my life or, you know, sufficient amounts. And she was already just used to it. So uh, wow. you kind of see patterns like that show up and uh, it's pretty cool to kind of have little reasons you know for those types of experiences those things you sort of intuitively know like you know something makes you feel good and then you can actually look on a, a pathway level and say oh yeah that's actually why i experienced that and then you know it gives you a whole bunch of ways to try new things that you you know just wouldn't have access to otherwise from the from that type of information Beyond the genetic testing, do you what what other kind of tests do you do because or me measuring sort of protocols do you use because you you do take a very holistic approach like you mentioned trauma and sleep. Um, so how do you track that? Is it just through conversations or? Uh, some of it's through subjective uh, experience and conversations, but I, I like the sleep trackers, uh, the Aura mm. Ring or the, the Phoenix watches are really good for that, um, just to actually have some objective data on what you're doing when you're actually not conscious you know it's it you can 
wake up in the morning and go, yeah, you know, I feel kind of rested or I don't feel rested, but actually yeah. having some tracking over overnight is really helpful. Um, especially when you're working with different interventions and supplements that we can actually look and say, all right, this actually improved uh, deep sleep by 20 minutes. Um, yeah, that, that's very helpful. Um, and then I'll do um, certain blood tests uh, and use those to track certain things. Um, so really more, the, the more um, data points I can get, you know, the better really in terms of building this holistic picture of what's going on. I want to, uh, I want to go more into detail with some of the things you found out in in a moment, but I want to go back and talk about your story, your backstory. So, how did you end up getting into this? It's a really fascinating and new field. So, I'm just curious, what was your own personal evolution that took you here? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, like a lot of people that have found themselves in a healing profession, I had to kind of figure my own stuff out first. And a lot of it was me being in the right place at the right time. Um, I'll tell you, my, my background is actually in music. I'm an electronic music producer. I still play gigs here and there. I played one over the weekend. Um, but, I, and, and, you know, when I, I was very fortunate to be successful in this and I was touring and, uh, staying up all night and leading living a lifestyle that really led to some health problems for me uh you know i wasn't paying attention to my body in my early to mid 20s and it just really caught up with me and i uh started experiencing some pretty weird health problems where kind of mainstream doctors were basically like yeah there's really nothing we're seeing here on these tests like you're basically fine and I was like, well, I'm passing out here and there randomly, like I'm, I'm not fine. So I, I you know, dove kind of deep into the biohacking world, um, really tried to understand what was going on with my body and realized that there actually wasn't like a single thing that I needed to do. It was this whole combination of lifestyle and nutrition and all the things I work on with people now. Um, but I had, you know, gotten my body back to a place where I was, you know, feeling pretty good. And I was working at a synthesizer manufacturer uh, here in Asheville, where I live, called Moog. Um, they're one of the older synthesizer companies. Um, I was building synths and just devouring podcasts about health and biohacking. Mm. And I, I took a uh, walk on my lunch break and real one day and realized that the logo of one of my favorite podcasts that I've been listening to was actually on the building next door. And it turned out <laughs> that this doctor that I'd been following his work for, you know, a few months and like was thinking like this guy has, you know, really has some of the answers I've been looking for, had a clinic next door. <laughs> so, wow. you know, what were the chances? And so I, I, I booked an appointment just because I wanted some blood work done and wanted to work with them as a client. And it turned out that they were actually looking for someone with audio production skills to help them develop brainwave entrainment and uh, binaural beat and meditation programs for this experimental sound chamber that they had built in this clinic. And so, of course, I was like, yes, I like how quickly can I leave this other job and come over and work with you guys? <laughs> Um, and so I worked for them for, for a bit and right around that same time, uh, this doctor, Dr. Dan Stickler, um, if you're familiar with Qualia or like the Neurohacker Collective guys, he's the medical director for them. Uh, wow. but he, uh, he started developing a training program for genetics and epigenetics because he had been doing this kind of off the grid in his clinical practice for seven or eight years or so um, and was getting all these requests from other physicians and, and people to train them in his method that he'd kind of put together over time. Um, and he recognized that, hey, I'd, I'd you know, really done my own research and had a pretty good foundation, a lot of the stuff. Um, and he asked me to be a beta tester essentially of this training program. Uh, and so I went through it about three times before he made it public. And, uh, you know, there's coaches and, you know, probably about 30 countries now that he's trained. Um, but, uh, I happened to just be in the right place at the right time. And, um, you know, had someone who I guess saw potential in me. And at that point I was a bit skeptical of, uh, believing that I was capable of, you know, working with other people in this way. I, I felt like I, Hey, I just got my health back to a place where I'm like not passing out, uh, for mm -hmm. no reason. Um, but I kind of, you know, I, I trusted his opinion of me and, um, I'm really glad I did because this has been, um, you know, just a, I don't know. It's one of those things where it's felt like, uh, to some degree, this is what I'm here to do. And, you know, when those synchronicities and, and things kind of fall into place, um, you know, sometimes it's the, uh, it just feels right to follow them. And, 
uh, that's kind of where I, how I got to where I am right now. Wow, so many cool synchronicities. I love that. Finding the the building next door with the logo on. And uh, what I'm just curious, what kind of podcasts were you listening to at that time? You said you were de- devouring health podcasts. Mm-hmm. Well, you, yeah, you mentioned Tim Ferriss. You know, I was listening mm-hmm. to Tim Ferriss and Dave Asprey and uh, a bunch of kind of more geeky biohacking ones. Um, this one from Dan Stickler was called Biohacking for Optimal Health at the time. Um, let's see. I think the Not Just Paleo podcast was one that I, I had listened to a lot of episodes of. Um have to go back and look at my my podcast app to to tell you all of them gotcha but. well i've i've also went through a, a like a quite an intense period of of listening to biohacking podcasts reading books on biohacking and um it's i found that listening to these podcasts almost the um, like kind of addictive in a way like because i was learning all of this amazing stuff that i could apply and that the, that wasn't being talked about in the mainstream but then i also realized that this would be an opportunity for people to kind of like cherry pick studies and mm-hmm. kind of like use the biohacking kind of label as a way to kind of give you information that was not so grounded in in research so how do you um, kind of like avoid the BS in the bio biohacking world? <laughs> That's such a good point, and, and you know I feel the same way. I mean, you see Dave Asprey, I think, is a good example of that, and I think they've tried to shift some of their platform away from the initial high fat is the answer for everyone type thing. Um, mm. You know, and and he fell he falls into that trap totally of what I'm talking about when I say like everyone gets really excited about their diet strategy that works for them because you know when you stumble across something that's actually suited for your genotype and for your body and you get such a you know positive response it's like you just your your natural bias is to think well this is the answer this is how everyone should do it um and i think that there is a yeah there's a there's also a bias and tendency to cherry pick studies and and especially when you're putting out a brand or a platform right like Mm. you trying to bolster that with as much science or seeming science as you can so you know i think in terms of uh navigating that you know it's i i find there's a certain ethos or mentality that I look for uh, and if I don't find it then I you know instantly become wary and I don't necessarily mm. throw out the baby with the bathwater but I just keep it in the back of my mind and I think that ethos is acknowledging that hey I don't know everything and this is you know one idea and when I see people that can present multiple possibilities and say hey here's one study there's actually another one that contradicts it over here I think this one is correct, but I'm also aware of this other data and I'm not trying to hide it. You know, I Mm. think that's important. And uh, to the best of my ability, I I try and and do that because, you know, like I'm hyper aware that there's there's articles out there. When you you search for, you know, does genetic testing work, you're going to find a whole bunch of ones that say, actually, no, it doesn't. This is a waste of money. And, um, you know, like Scientific American ran a article titled genetic testing doesn't work you know and part of it is that um the general um and and the the general kind of uh flavor of those articles i feel like is is pretty cherry picked uh in terms of looking at small studies where you're only looking at three or four genes and saying hey this doesn't work and i totally agree actually that um when you only look at two or three, you know, maybe five or six genes, like the chances that that's going to be effective is, is pretty slim. Mm. Uh, because when you really start working with, with people and understand how complex this stuff is, you really have to be looking at, you know, uh, 50, 60, 100. I, you know, when I do a full read, I look at about 400 different genes. It's like you can't just isolate and be reductionistic about it. It's more about looking at things from a complex systems approach. So it's like, on one hand, I actually agree with those articles. They're just written uh, kind of in the wrong premise uh, in terms of uh, not really taking the the possibilities of the art and science of this to the the full extent. So um, does that answer your question there? 
Yeah, totally. And I was going to say as well that it, it, like, saying the genetic testing doesn't work, it's it's like, well, the question that I would follow up with, well, it doesn't work for what? Mm -hmm. Because everyone comes to it with a different goal. So if your goal is, like, I'm going to measure a few of my genes and then modify my diet and expect to lose 200 pound it's like well <laughs> i mean yeah maybe it won't work like that maybe like you you need to have like a, a, an appropriate goal and have uh, to accompany that uh, an appropriate testing and, and a holistic testing the likes of which you do looking at sleep and, and lifestyle as well right exactly it's it's like if you're just going to try and change one variable you know just change diet and you don't look at anything else in someone's life like you know that's and you know maybe that is worthwhile for someone who just wants very reductionistic data but that's not how stuff works in the real world so let's look at everything you know as holistically and, and fully as we can i think mm -hmm. eric did you have something to say yeah I have two things that that came up there one is so you know listening to this i get inspired i want to go take my health into my own hands more and I go out and I talk to my my primary healthcare provider right and what I what I notice a lot is if you're if you're essentially a healthy normal right a lot of your markers are good that's kind of where they leave you at mm -hmm. like oh hey say I want to increase my testosterone right but it's already in a reasonable range I find the conversation often just stops there where it's like hey yeah you're doing good not not much else you need to do so where would you go or, or how do you broach the conversation if it's like I really do want to you know move into this like self optimization space like really see how far I can turn these dials but I might not be comfortable doing it myself or at that level where I want to tinker with all these things alone do you have do you have a path forward there yeah and I, I think what you're describing is so common and you know it's not necessarily those doctors fault because they're in a system where for the most part they're a slave to the insurance companies that are telling them you can only see someone for 10 minutes and we got to get as many people in it as an hour so as long as someone falls into the quote unquote normal range like that's kind of it um you know and, and there's definitely a difference between normal blood values and optimal blood values like you're saying with testosterone and other things like that um, you know there there are practitioners out there that are more focused on the optimal health side that really do like looking at um, uh, you know blood values in a, in a slightly different way or uh, working with things from a more holistic perspective um, you know you can find you know, there's kind of every level of practitioner out there. I mean, I'm a coach, so, you know, I'm not a doctor, uh, but that's what I focus on with people. I know several doctors that do that type of work as well. Um, it's just kind of, uh, and, and, you know, honestly, I think most doctors, if they had the choice, would be wanting to help people take things to the next level. Um, I feel like it's more of a time constraint and knowledge constraint in certain ways. Um, but you know they are out there, and if you search for you know people in the in the functional medicine world or the optimal health world, concierge practice um, stuff like that, I, I think you can definitely find some people that are willing to you know be a partner in in moving you forward with that. And I think that there's a different mentality, right? Like um, in that space that I really like, um, that seems to be less hierarchical and authoritative. Whereas when you're going to kind of a, just a standard doctor, there tends to be this, uh, sense of, well, I know best, and this is what you need to do. And more and more in the optimal health space, I really think that people have more of a mentality of, um, well, let's kind of work together on this and see what happens. Um, you know, I've got some, some knowledge, but in the large majority of cases, I feel like there's actually more credit given to you uh, in terms of what you want to see and where you want to go. And there's more of a willingness to kind of experiment and explore a little bit and help you do it safely and, and effectively. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. It, it feels like it feels like we're at this state where we've mastered survival, but we haven't quite gotten into thriving yet. Like it's mm -hmm. really, really reaching that full expression. And with with some of the conversation thus far, I, I want to try to paint a very, very clear picture for people. I feel like we almost backpacked in the assumptions that we all understand what genetics are and what epigenetics are, but that, that may not be 
as clear as we might think. Could, could Good you, point. Could you speak to a like what what do genetics actually do for us? Like what does my DNA do? And then where does epigenetics come into this? Like is it a separate thing? Are the words do the words mean the same? And is a uh, are our genes as as like hardwired as we might think, or are they maybe a bit more flexible or open to input? Yeah, fantastic. Um, be happy to kind of tease that apart. So our DNA is essentially the blueprint for everything that goes on in our body. Um, it's kind of the instruction manual that our cells use to create all of the proteins uh, and other products that build our bodies up, all of our biochemistry, all of the physical structural things, instructions for making those things uh, are all contained within the DNA. And you can kind of think about it as, you know, like a, a recipe for your body um, that we have cellular machinery that kind of transcribes it, builds it out, and it's what makes you you and what makes me me, essentially. Um, and the, the DNA code itself is made out of these um, little molecules called nucleotides, and it's the exact order and arrangement of those things that uh, can cause these individual differences. And so, you know, we, we mapped the human genome uh, in 2001. We, we essentially figured out this big, you know, street map of everything uh, that happens in our DNA, every all these little places in it, because we have uh, these regularities that appear from person to person. Like most of the arrangement of our DNA is the same. Um, it it's just kind of there's these little differences in one or two letters here and there that create the you know individuality. Uh, but for the most part, uh, we actually have very similar structure. Um, and by mapping the human genome, we sort of figured out all right we know where this gene exists in this long string of other genes and then through time we figured out what those genes do what proteins they code for um, which you could think like all right certain genes are going to code for proteins that make your hair color a certain color uh, or your eye color a certain color or create enzymes that uh, you know break down vitamin a or uh, saturated fat like almost every you know every single function in your body has correlated genes with them so when we're talking about what genetics do uh, they really provide this very foundational blueprint uh, like I mentioned before it's kind of like the hardware um, of your body and while that doesn't change you know you are gonna have the same code that you're born with um, epigenetics describes this other layer to that where those genes can actually change the amount or the quality of those products that they create, those proteins. And um, epigenetics kind of means control above genes. And in the, I believe it's Latin that it's, it, it comes from. Uh, and so it describes this um, control system that can turn genes on and turn genes off or turn them up and down. If you kind of imagine like a dimmer switch um, that allows you to respond dynamically to information that you get from the environment, uh, to the food that you're eating, to the light you're receiving, um, to you know uh, all these different factors that as humans, we kind of have to evolve and adapt with. Um, we can actually change the biochemistry in our bodies to respond to those things. And you know this can happen on different time scales. Uh, epigenetics are actually, um, you know, something that happens in our body on a second by second, uh, hour by hour basis. You know, it's, it's what uh, controls our clocks in our body. Uh, we have all these, these clock genes, and I'll just give you an example for like a 24 hour period. Um, we have clock genes in our body that control certain hormones that get released in the morning to help us wake up and certain hormones at night that help us go to sleep. Uh, that's under epigenetic control. Uh, and then you have certain things that um, you know might change seasonally or in response to you know your diet or exercise. Like uh, for example, exercise changes you know four to five thousand genes uh, in the way they express. So like that's a pretty massive response. I mean, if you think about how you know 
regular exercise impacts your body and why it's good for you, it's largely because of the epigenetic expression that it's shifting and changing, where it's uh, boosting and upregulating genes that are positive, health promoting, and, and downregulating ones that are inflammatory and um, uh, might be problematic to have boosted. So you, know, you kind of have this combination of this base layer, this instruction manual, um, you know, uh, or a recipe, and then you have the secondary layer that says, all right, you know, within this recipe, it calls for two cups of flour. Um, you know, why don't we use three cups here? Uh, because the environment is calling for it. And we know that that's, uh, you know, going to be more useful in this environment. And the other layer to that is epigenetics um, can actually be passed down intergenerationally they found now. Um, and when you look at a lot of indigenous traditions that have uh, the idea that what you do in your lifetime is going to impact seven generations you know, forward in, in front of you, um, there's pretty strong science now that actually supports that. Um, you know, especially major life events uh, like trauma or star, you know, starvation or eating a, a very fatty diet. You know, there's, those things have been shown to impact epigenetic markers down the line. Um, and so, and those things can get passed down in sperm and, and, and eggs. And um, it's, uh, it's pretty remarkable in terms of A, the flexibility of the human system to uh, not just, you know, kind of exist in the static state, but actually have this incredibly complex way of adapting and B, uh, how we can actually harness that, you know, and take advantage of it and uh, really uh, use it for change. And there's a, there's a nice article, if you search the phrase epigenetics, the science of change, it's an academic article that uh, lays out this concept of, of how to, um, you know, kind of think about leveraging epigenetics in a way that uh, gives us more control potentially over uh, our, our systems and the way that our, our bodies are expressing different things over time. Does that kind of um, answer those, que those questions there? Absolutely. And I'm, I'm really glad we, we got to this point. Um, I want to zoom in really quickly on epigenetic inheritance. But before, I, j I just want to underline, you know, it was, it was quite mind-blowing or mind-boggling the first time you know, you come across something like epigenetics and you and you sit and you realize that like there are things that you can do or that your environment can do that influence or nudge your genetic code. Like that, there, there's a great amount of a feeling of power or agency that comes when, when you sit with that. But I, I do want to focus a little, a little more or take a few more minutes on epigenetic inheritance or transgenerational epigenetic inheritance. Um, because this is something, this is something that I think has flown under the radar of, I guess, common knowledge for far too long, and the way the way that we've seen this come to life as well is that um, we also help orchestrate a retreat series, and there have been a few individuals who have come through the retreat and through some of their own work they share stories of, you know, I, I felt the pain of my ancestors and I felt like I was. I was experiencing what they had went through, all the suffering or all the, the sickness, and that I was a part of, of both feeling that and in doing that, healing it. But I think we we failed to realize that, and maybe if you're comfortable, I noticed on your website that I think you have almost your own story of epigenetic inheritance with your grandparents. Um, are you comfortable speaking about that? Oh yeah, definitely, and I, I think it's actually a central piece of uh, a lot of what led me into this, and you know, um, yeah, my, my grandparents on my mom's side were in the Holocaust in concentration camps. And um, there are good academic studies showing that uh, relatives, you know, uh, children and grandchildren of Holocaust survivors tend to have a heightened stress response. And uh, I can tell you that I, I'm pretty sure that that's one of the things that was impacting me when I was you know, having issues passing out randomly and my nervous system was you know, thrown off and, and firing in ways that it really shouldn't have been. Basically um, putting me into a, a freeze response, like flight, fight, or freeze um, at little things that shouldn't have really been activating it. Um, and when I look at my, my family dynamics and uh, all that, you know, it, it makes sense. Um, and 
it's it's not just you know the Holocaust. It's it's any you know major traumatic kind of thing that can leave those kind of imprints. And when you zoom out, you know, and really think about like, okay, why is the body doing this? It, it's about the survival response mechanism. Like if you go through a significant trauma, your body is trying to prepare the next generation to go through something similar. Um, you know, it's trying to, to give you the tools and create this sort of uh, set of neurochemistry that's going to be responsive to that and be able to mobilize you in an instant and run away. Um, and, to, and, you know, it, there's, uh, there's also these studies uh, around something called the Dutch hunger uh, or the you know, the Dutch famine studies, um, where during World War II there was a blockade uh, into Holland where they couldn't get food in for you know three or four months, and you know it was kind of a, a, a nationwide starvation episode. And what they found was that women that were pregnant at that time, uh, depending on what trimester that they were pregnant, when they didn't have access to food, there were different effects on their children and grandchildren. In that, in some cases, uh, it, they, they had ec- extremely high rates of obesity, and in some cases, they actually had extreme had much lower rates of o- obesity. So you can see that while you know people were in gestation, though the 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 systems were trying to adapt and say, all right, in this situation, like we need to store as much fat and as much energy as possible so that we can adapt to this. Or in other cases, you know, just diff- depending on what time they were in the womb, um, it might be saying, all right, well, we're not going get to get any food anyway, so we're not going to store, you know, we're not going to store fat um, or however, you know, the logic goes there. Um, but you see those kind of extreme things show up and what you're talking about in terms of the emotional side of it and there being... Um, you know, the sense of ancestral trauma, inheritance, and working through that, uh, you know, you can you know, refer to it as past lives. I, I think that's where a lot of the past life stuff comes from uh, in some ways. And, you know, I, I may be wrong there, um, but I've experienced certain things like that too, where um, doing intense emotional release work, I don't have specific memories myself of like being in a situation yet when I've gone really deep into the kind of the underlying layers of my psyche, like there's stuff there that I've processed that feels really liberating uh, from like a lineage perspective or from this sort of amorphous stored emotion in my body kind of perspective. And, you know, it, it, it very much makes me wonder how much of that is inherited family trauma, how much of that is working out something epigenetically that, um, you know, might be making a change in in that way. And um, I think that right now that the technology isn't quite there yet to like do like analysis of, of, of genes from the epigenetic side and say like what happens when someone does extreme emotional release work. Um, you know, you'd kind of have to have like look at what epigenetic marks are present when someone's born versus like after that. And I, I think there's a lot of potential for some, some work there. Um, but I would venture to guess that a lot of, that type of intuitive knowingness of, hey, the, these are things that I'm working out um, that aren't even necessary for my lifetime, uh, that there's you know going to be some epigenetic changes. And the science does support that kind of thing in terms of doing emotional work and uh, there being related epigenetic changes in certain genes when you're able to you know release stored trauma in the body and um, there's a pretty strong epigenetic component to, to PTSD and um, other traumatic related uh, things like that. Yeah, that is a really, really powerful sentiment. You know, we, we've we've shared with some people this notion of, you know, you might be walking around with a weight that you don't need to carry, right? And and there's almost this recognition now that, you know, you may have you may have been given that weight, that genetic weight from, like you didn't even pick it up. It might have been inherited. You know, you are quite literally the byproduct of of your entire lineage, and it even just underscores the importance of asking your parents what their lives were like asking your grandparents like what it is they went through because uh it quite literally became you at the end of the day uh john did you have anything come up during that um the thing that came up for me was related to trauma um 
when you are working with a client, David, and uh, you're taking a, a look at their lifestyle and their nutrition and everything else, and they have some sort of trauma or sort of psychological issue like social anxiety, which is obviously very common um, nowadays. How do you approach that? Do you look at nutrition first? Um, I'm just trying to get a, an idea of how you would deal more with the sort of psychological realm when you work with people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'll tell you right now, I'm actually getting a master's degree in mental health counseling uh, so that I'm mm. more equipped to really work with people in, in that way. And um, I see the the mental and emotional really tied into the physical. Uh, yet at the same time, I think there's a, a very specific sk- set of skills that um, you know is, is worth having the training for. So in certain cases, I'll refer clients to go see a therapist if there is something that I feel is you know more than I'm capable of within my scope of practice Um, but I'll speak from personal experience that when I first shifted a lot of nutrition and lifestyle factors I was mentioning earlier um, kind of as a necessity uh, it opened up a lot of opportunity for the first time in my life to do the deeper uh, emotional work that I'd essentially been avoiding for the first 25 years or so of my life. Um, and I, I think a lot of it was because I had more available brain power and energy and, and ability to sit with difficult emotions that, that previously um, would have triggered my nervous system into shutting down and, and not being capable of actually responding. So, um, you know, I'll work with people from a nutritional and supplement perspective um, and you know try and help them develop the capacity to do more of that work and you know I'll give people certain tools um, whether that's something like brainwave and training programs that help people kind of get into those contemplative states or certain cognitive tools Um, you know I'm a big fan of a lot of the um, kind of somatic body processing modalities um, and you know kind of um, give people tools to work through that stuff on their own. Uh, you know, there's a few books that I, I really like in, in that domain. Um, and yeah, then I'll refer people to therapists as well. Cause I, I think that um, coming at that type of thing, you know, reprocessing trauma or re um, establishing patterns of emotional behavior, you know, and, and relationship to self. And um, you know, when you are able to, enter that from as many angles as possible, you know, through shifting some of the biochemistry through food or or supplements, as well as, you know, doing therapeutic modalities that are more designed to uh, really reprocess experiences and um, become more honest and vulnerable with with yourself. You know, I think combining those two things together only reinforces them. Um, And there's many entry points into that type of change. So, um, you know, try and just try and keep it multi-dimensional i suppose uh, as much as mm. possible great so if, if if i was listening to this interview now and i've never had any of this testing done and maybe i haven't even explored biohacking i'll be probably asking is there anything that i could that i could try you know any other are there any sort of unusual practices or experiments that i could run this week to see if if i could you know get more energy or improve my sleep now i know that the testing you do is specific to the person but i was wondering if you picked up any overall patterns um that you could sort of share with us that our listeners could experiment with if that's even possible. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, like I said before, there's there's certain foundational things that I think everyone can implement, regardless of if mm-hmm. you want to go down into the individual kind of precision approach. Um, and you know, I think I, I mentioned too that I think light is a really underappreciated um, kind of factor in people's lives right now. And you know, when you zoom out in human history, we're only about a hundred years or so into the artificial light experiment. And I don't really see it having very positive effects overall on human health. Um, You know, if you imagine a couple hundred years ago, the only light we would have been exposed to would be from fire and the sun. We didn't have light bulbs. And our bodies are pretty exquisitely 
does tuned to light as a input source of information. Uh, we use light as a timing mechanism to help our bodies understand uh, when to release certain hormones and, and neurotransmitters. And um, it has a very ubiquitous and profound effect on many different systems of the body. And we're in a time period right now uh, where we are constantly exposed to artificial lighting that has a very different spectrum than natural light from the sun. Um, and so my recommendation for anyone that's uh, that's saying, hmm, yeah, I'd like to try something, you know, kind of in the biohacking world, which, um, you know, from my perspective, it is about just taking tr control over your, your biology and being able to affect change within your body. Um, one of the biggest things you can do is limit your exposure to blue light. Uh, that's coming from screens, especially, and uh, fluorescent and LED lights. Because when you look at the breakdown of light frequencies, uh, that those bulbs emit compared to the sun, um, it's almost totally reversed in terms of the sun has very high uh, red hue and very low blue. And most bulbs, uh, fluorescent LEDs and screens are very high in the blue spectrum and relatively low in the red spectrum. And uh, because blue light isn't you know, very present in the natural environment, our, our body's very sensitive to it. Uh, like if you look up at the sky right before, um, or you know, right after the sun rises and right before the sun sets, you'll notice the sky looks very blue comparatively. You get kind of this like two or three minute little flash of um, just this blue expression. And if without artificial light, that would have been really these two parts of the day where our, our eyes were designed to like pick up on that blue light and say, all right, here's a, a phase shift from day to night, night to day. And uh, melatonin, uh, which is one of the major uh, sleep uh, hormones, and it's a really important antioxidant, serves a lot of different functions in the body, um, is sensitive to blue light. It, blue light will suppress the production of it, which, um, or actually bright light in general will suppress the production of it, which you want during the day. You don't want to be sleepy during the day. Um, but at night, when we typically would have only been exposed to like small amounts of fire, candles, that kind of thing, um, it, it would have allowed it to start to produce, you know, at the right time, which is, you know, roughly around 10, 11 o'clock. Um, and when we're exposed to screens and, and artificial lighting right up until we go to sleep, we actually suppress the production of melatonin uh, for a few hours. Melatonin will only start to really build up, um, uh, you know, a couple hours after our last exposure to blue light. So we're uh, by, you know, by looking at lots of screens and, and exposure to blue light through our eyes at night, we are suppressing a really important sleep hormone, uh, which when you look at the research now, I mean, it's profound in terms of the impact on obesity, type two diabetes, depression, anxiety, um, almost, almost every single disease has some type of relationship to either circadian disruption or to when they've studied it, a higher risk with more exposure to blue light at night. Um, and it's one of those things where, you know, it's not the cause of all of those things, but I believe it's a strong contributing factor um, to a lot of dysfunction in the body. So, you know, if you're interested in playing around with that, uh, you can get blue blocking glasses that are, you know, are designed to be worn after the sun goes down until you go to sleep, uh, which are profoundly helpful for improving sleep quality. Um, because instead of, you know, if you go to sleep at, at 10 o'clock and you've been looking at blue light that whole time, well, you're not going to really start producing melatonin for another two hours or so. Uh, and so those first two hours of sleep are, you know, going to be way less uh, effective for repair and regeneration then if you started wearing blue blocking glasses at eight o'clock, went to sleep at 10 o'clock, then you're actually producing the hormones that are going to help your body re uh, regenerate and get good sleep. Um, so you can do that. You can get um, uh, filters that are software that help change the screen temperature and color that come out of your screens. Um, there's a, a really good one um, called Iris that I like. And uh, you can also just change the way that you use light at night you know you can get amber or red bulbs that are going to be way less intense in the blue light spectrum and mm. I, I and the other flip side of that is actually you know trying to get more sun exposure especially in the morning when you wake up because that's the signal for your body to wake up and reinforce the other side of the cycle um 
And, you know, I, I really feel like we're going to look back on this period in history as we made a big mistake and we just didn't understand what we were doing because uh, we were uh, enraptured by new technology and we just hadn't done the research yet to really understand the, the broad impact of light on the human body. And, um, you know, I would say that that is a pretty foundational place to start with and something that I work with most of my clients on as well. For me, I've only very recently actually started taking my sleep seriously. Mm -hmm. Like I'm, I'm 29 now and I do a lot of self-care practices, but sleep was always this thing that I, I didn't really have a healthy respect for sleep. You know, I, I would kind of burn the candle at both ends and want to be as productive as possible. Um, but recently I've been really seeing clearly the mistake that that is and how fundamental sleep is to health and wellness and, and well-being. Um, but I, I do think there's, there's definitely a little bit of this um, lack of respect for sleep in certain productivity circles, you know, where it's like, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger, um, you know, openly says that he sleeps six hours a day because he values the extra two hours. I know Elon Musk on his uh, Reddit AMA said that he sleeps six hours and and people are saying that they, they, they're willing to sacrifice a couple of hours of sleep to get a, a bit more work in. And I know there's a genetic component to uh, sleeping uh, time, but how important is sleep uh, for health and well-being from your experience and research? I would say that sleep is the glue that really holds all of those other self-care practices together. You can eat as well as you want, you can exercise as much as you want, um, but in the long run, if you're not sleeping well, you're going to run into issues. There's just no avoiding it. Sleep is just an essential part of maintaining healthy function in the body. and what you're describing, that sort of the sense of, you know, I'll sleep when I'm dead. Uh, mm. You know, I, I think it's, it, like, yeah, in the short term, you, you might be able to do that. And actually, by, in, by, you know, doing everything else right, like, you can get away with it in the short term. But when you look at long-term effects of that, it's, it's not really worth it, uh, I don't think. And, uh, you know, it, it, like what you said about having respect for sleep, um, it's not something that's culturally, um, you know, appreciated. Like, uh, and I certainly didn't appreciate it in, until I realized how much better it made me feel. You know, I mean, I I used to work on music until five in the morning and then go play gigs until three or four in the morning, and um, mm -hmm. you know, just really didn't have a, a, a sense of appreciation for how sleep was affecting me and throwing everything else off. Um, and what you're saying in terms of a genetic factor, um, you know, most people uh, really do need at least seven, eight hours of sleep. Uh, there's some genes that are associated with, you know, being able to get away with closer to seven, closer to nine. And there is one very rare variant. It's in a gene called DEC2 um, that is associated with people being able to sleep six hours and not have any impact, negative impact from it. But that variant occurs in less than 1% of the population. So most people that think that they're capable of getting six hours and getting by with it probably really don't. Maybe Elon Musk does have that. You know, maybe Arnold Schwarzenegger does have that variant. Um, but at the same time, it's like coming back full circle here. Just because something works for someone else doesn't mean you can necessarily expect it, it, it too. They might just be kind of lucky in that regard with mm. uh, that particular variant. So if someone was... Uh, came to you and was like I'm really busy I am really ambitious I have tons of work that I want to get done do you I, I find that you know eight and a half hours is my s sweet spot for sleep do you think that uh, I can sleep for six hours um, and for the next sort of five to ten years um, will that have any like negative impact um, or do you think that I would actually be more productive if I slept more, you know? So what would you say? Would you be more productive, net productive, if you cut the sleep or net productive if you included the, the extra two hours a night? Yeah, I mean, I, I would tend to lean towards you would be more net productive if you got more sleep and were actually able to be more awake and aware during the day. When you look mm. at the studies that correlate um, 
sleep quality with cognitive perform or sleep length with cognitive performance. Um, once you're getting less than seven hours of sleep, uh, for every hour less, it's about the equivalent of a drink or two of alcohol uh, in terms of cognitive performance. I mean, it's pretty pretty strong. Like I believe that it's like five hours of sleep. They've shown it's it, it people have the cognitive performance of about like being legally drunk, um, <laughs> wow. you know. So it, it, it's it's strong. Like, um, and the thing about our bodies is that they actually have built-in systems to prevent us from realizing that we're functioning at a lower level. Like, it's very hard to tell. There's good studies that really show that we are very poor judges of how. Uh, well we're functioning especially when we've gotten lower sleep like people will rate their ability to to function at a higher level than they actually are functioning uh, when they're at a cognitive deficit and I think to some degree it's kind of an evolutionary uh, evolutionarily like advantageous thing uh, to have a little bit of almost like a placebo effect built in is to be able to like run away when you need to run away uh, and say yes I can do it I'm actually functioning at a high level um, but you know when you're talking about running a business or, or doing something that, you know, has a lot of details that you need to be pay, paying attention to. Um, yeah, I'd, I would lean towards um, respecting your sleep as something that's really important. And, you know, mm. there, there are ways to um, improve sleep quality and, you know, get the absolute maximum sleep quality to where, um, you know, you might be able to sleep a little bit less if you're doing um, all the right things and, um, you know, giving giving yourself maybe some you know some extra boosts here and there and tracking sleep and really understanding how you can maximize the quality and you know get the most out for the least amount in but at the same time it's like you're only going to be able to squeeze down your amount of sleep so much before you start to see negative impacts i think another big thing that's come up, come up in recent years is intermittent fasting or uh time restricted feeding have you done much research into this? Yeah, I'm just wondering I, what your thoughts are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the um, the fasting piece is is really fascinating to me. Um, honestly, the the general like longer term fasting more so than daily intermittent um, in terms of the, the benefits. You know, I think it's helpful. I've I've done some experimentation with it. Um, you know, especially for anyone that's managing blood sugar issues, it, it's counterintuitive because you think that, you know, the, the general advice for people that have blood sugar issues is to like eat a snack every two hours. Um, but the, the research really shows that, you know, if you are, you know, you go through the hell of, you know, not, not eating for a couple of days, it can actually really reset the, that system in your body. Um, and giving yourself the metabolic space not to be digesting food all the time and being able to allocate resources to other things um, is seems to be profoundly helpful um, for a variety of different conditions. And, um, you know, I, I think that the, the modern idea is we need to be eating all the time. Uh, we need to have three meals a day. And really, when you look at uh, human history, like, that's not how we did it for a long time and I, I think there's tremendous value towards variation um, and not necessarily um, doing the exact same thing every day um, and giving yourself periods of time which you know interestingly a lot of religious traditions and spiritual traditions have the idea of fasting um, embedded within them you know of at least you know doing a day fast once a year or three day fast or Ramadan doing a whole month um, the human body is capable of, of of adapting to that and the you know the, the biometrics on it are generally really pretty good um for improving function in a, in a pretty wide variety of areas so you know i think it's for most people worth considering mm -hmm. uh so i i think we're close to wrapping up but i wanted to ask you a question about where you see your future like in, in the next sort of like what you're going to be focusing on in the next year and then on a bigger scale the future of epigenetic testing and where where you think that this will lead us you know in the, in the, in the far off future yeah absolutely so like i mentioned before i'm, I'm going back and getting a master's degree in uh, mental health counseling and i'm especially interested in the psychedelic assisted psychotherapies that are being researched right now and mm. um I'm planning on being a part of that, assuming everything, you know, is going goes according to plan there. Um, but I, I really see um, 
being able to bring in an integrative approach with all of the stuff that I'm doing with clients currently with lifestyle and nutrition and all of that and, and really bringing it into a space where I'm capable of working with people on a more emotional and um, you know deeper level on that side of things. Because like I mentioned, for me, that's been the real uh, kind of linchpin of change is working from all those angles. Um, so I'll be working with that. Um, also, uh, we you know, we didn't get to get into it today, but I've also done a, a good bit of research on how genes impact people's response to cannabis. Um, and so I'm working on formalizing a uh, test that I've been running in beta with people to help people understand how their endocannabinoid is, system is wired and give people some insight into why they respond to, to THC and other cannabinoids in the way that they do. And um, I'll be uh, having that available soon and got a couple other projects um, in the genetics and, and psychedelic space that I'm working on right now um, in cannabis space as well. Um, so, you know, for me, it's more, it's really about seeing how I can integrate my understanding of genetics and epigenetics with um, more of a psycho-emotional approach and um, hopefully being able to provide more effective services for people just ongoing. Um, and then your, your other question in terms of the future of uh, genetic testing and, and epigenetic testing, uh, which I really want to make it, a, 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 you know, dis distinguish between those two. Um, I think that right now, you know, the actual being able to test epigenetic marks on genes is fairly limited. There's, there's a couple good tests out there that want, there's one called DNA age that will give you um, this panel uh, that's associated with biological age, similar to like telomeres. Um, and that's pretty well researched right now. But the, the possibilities for epigenetic testing directly, I mean, it's huge. And being able to really monitor those marks as they change over time is something that I think is going to absolutely revolutionize um, you know, the, the field and uh, the ability to very precisely make differences in, in health and uh, especially longevity. Um, hmm. And, you know, there, there's some of that being done in cancer research right now, looking at epigenetic marks on, on cancer genes and things like that. Um, but I, I think that in the next 10 years, five years, we're going to see some really interesting technologies come out, um, not just with being able to test for those things, but being able to edit them uh, more directly with um, you know, things like CRISPR, um, because people often think about CRISPR as, you know, solely for the nuclear DNA, the, the just general DNA code. But there's been experiments where they've actually been able to edit epigenetic marks as well, um, which in terms of looking at downstream effects is probably going to be safer actually than editing the, the kind of main genome just because there's less chance of you know unforeseen effects uh, mm. in my opinion uh, and then you know just in the in the future of genetic testing we're it's just going to get more precise and as there's more and more research that either confirms or adds another layer of complexity to what we already know um, we're just going to see uh, the ability to predict outcomes grow and um, you know, I, my my kind of um, I don't know utopian future vision is that uh, it's a human right, right? Like it's a human right to know um, how you're wired and what are the things you need to be doing to live a healthy life. Um, you know, just something that like when you're born, like this is a established basic thing that. Um, you should know what types of fats are going to create inflammation in your body and, you know, what nutrient deficiencies you're, you're more prone to. Um, and I think, you know, that's obviously uh, an idealist kind of far out thing, but um, that's how I feel about this information because of how impactful I, I see it is, on, you know, on people when they can connect their experience and, and their bodies with, um, you know, more objective information and kind of go from this... Um, guesswork kind of framework that we're mostly used to into something that's a little more personalized and individualized and um, you know I think the understanding piece is, is also just you know I think it, it for me it creates more empathy for people you know being able to understand that people are actually wired differently in certain ways and so things that we might not understand why someone you know responds this way to one thing or um, in response a different way to another 
when you can actually have some reason for it, it actually creates more empathy towards other people's biology. And I can only see good coming out of that. Mm. Wow. Was there anything that came up for you then, Eric? <laughs> Nothing I think we have the time to go into now. <laughs> I think we need a we need another round of this because we had, we had a lot uh, come up that I still want to go into. You know, the brainwave entrainment, um, genes and g- genetic expression and psychedelics, the interplay there. Um, even even stuff like lucid dreaming, I know you've you've had some, some thoughts and experience in. Um, but overall, I, I think we opened up like a really beautiful like Pandora's box for people here. This is a really fascinating field that's that's coming into light, and I really agree with everything you just riffed on there, David. Like this is it's an incredibly exciting space to be in, and and looking into the future seems incredibly bright. Absolutely, and I, I'd love to come back and, and riff on uh, epigenetic effects of, of psychedelics and, uh, you know, kind of speculate on that, because I feel like that um, that is a whole rabbit hole to go down. Um, so, you know, I'd love to do it again. Had a, this was a great conversation, so thanks for having me on. So there's the teaser trailer for the next the next conversation we have because um, I would also love to talk about all of that stuff. I think this conversation served as a really good introduction to your work. Where can people find more about you and and work with you if they if they choose? Yeah, so my my website is David hyphen Krantz uh, David dash K R A N T Z dot com. And you can find more about my services there if you're interested in finding out about, um, you know, how I could work with you or how I could help you uh, for free 30 minute consultations uh, where we can kind of go over, you know, what the different options are for genetic testing and epigenetic coaching and um, see if something is right for you. Um, and other than that, you know, I have some articles up there. I've got a, a hour long presentation on cannabis and how gene, how certain genes impact your response to cannabis. Um, so that's something to check out. And um, other than that, yeah, you know, I've got a bunch of other podcasts you can check out as well. And um, uh, yeah, send me a message if you're interested and, you know, we'll go from there. That's, that's kind of where most people can find me. Great. We'll definitely add a link to your website in the show notes of this episode. Um, thank you very much. That was an enlightening conversation. I've learned a lot, and I'm going to be buying some blue blockers for sure, hundred percent. After this conversation. Wonderful. Well, yeah, it was a su- it was a pleasure having me on. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the High Existence Podcast. I hope that you enjoyed that episode. You took some tips from it. You had some epiphanies. If that is the case, leaving a review and a rating will go a long way towards helping us keep the podcast thriving and get really, really good guests on the show. Until next time.